But uh, Ray, again, just asking, how do you feel about commandment number four? I just want to know if you know the truth about the fourth commandment, about keeping the Lord's Sabbath. And no, we shouldn't be arguing about this in front of your friend. His salvation is so important, we should be preaching Christ. Right about your salvation too, because if we're going to go ahead and use the scripture as a piece of evidence to follow God's law, we should go ahead and follow it as he intended, which is the seventh day, keeping it holy. I'm often asked by Seventh-day Adventists, when I'm reasoning with the lost, why it is that I ignore the fourth commandment, to keep the Sabbath holy. Those who ask this can sound very convincing as to why we should keep that commandment. They often say that God gave the Sabbath as a sign to his people. Jesus kept the Sabbath, the Apostle Paul's custom was to go to the synagogues on the Sabbath, and history shows us that the Roman Catholic Church changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday. Let's look closely at these arguments. Firstly, God gave the Sabbath as a sign. This is from Exodus 31, 12 to 13. And the Lord God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is the sign between me and you throughout all generations. Verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. The Sabbath was a sign between the children of Israel and God. There's no biblical basis to maintain that it was given as a sign to a particular denomination. Secondly, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Luke 4 verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. It was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath because he was Jewish. That's what godly Jews do. He was brought up under the law and he perfectly kept every one of its 613 precepts. Thirdly, Paul's custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Let's look at why Paul, as a believer in Jesus, went to synagogues on the Sabbath. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Paul loved his people and had a burning passion to reach them with the gospel. He therefore went to the synagogue on the Sabbath to reason with the Jews about Jesus being the Christ. To maintain that he went there to keep the law flies in the face of the entire book of Galatians. Look at the day the disciples gathered together to break bread, to fellowship, and to open the scriptures. Now on the first day of the week, Sunday, when we were gathered together to break bread, share communion, Paul began talking with them, intending to leave the next day, and he kept on with his message until midnight. If we keep the same day the disciples kept, Sunday, it has nothing to do with what the Roman Catholic Church did in history. What they did is irrelevant. If Christians were supposed to keep the Sabbath, the ideal time for Scripture to have told us so would have been in Acts 15. If Christians should keep the Sabbath, the disciples need only to say, and remember to keep the Sabbath holy. Instead, they said the opposite, to whom we gave no such commandment. There is not one commandment in the entire New Testament for Christians to keep the Sabbath holy. If there was, I would gladly keep it and I would encourage others to do so. What is a Seventh-day Adventist and what makes us different? Well, in a word, Seventh-day Adventists are very simply Bible Christians. I don't believe I'm saved more by keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath than I am by not committing adultery or by not stealing or lying. It's all part of God's law and if we love the Lord, we're going to want to keep his commandments. The problem is, there are 613 Old Testament commandments. If we love the Lord, why should we stop at 10? I would suggest to those who keep the Jewish Sabbath that they make sure that they keep it on the same day that the nation of Israel keeps it. That day would be on a Friday or possibly a Sunday, depending where in the world we're located. This is because of the man-made international dateline established in 1884. When that was established, it changed the days and times. As Christians, we have a great liberty in what we eat, in what we drink, where, or the day or days we esteem. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. 
let each be fully convinced in his own mind. I have no right to tell any Christian what he should eat, drink, wear, what music he should listen to, or what day he should esteem. That's between him and God. I should never tell him that he has to keep the law, something the disciples said tests God and puts a restrictive yoke on the neck of believers. When I take the loss through the Ten Commandments, I use them as a mirror to show sinners their sinful condition. I really mention the fourth commandment because the unregenerate conscience won't respond to it as it does the commandments that refer to lying, stealing, blasphemy, adultery, and lust. These are obvious sins. Failing to keep the Sabbath holy is not. I also don't use it because Jesus didn't use it when he brought the knowledge of sin to the rich young ruler. He quoted five commandments and left out the Sabbath. I suggest that those who want to meet on Saturday, meet on Saturday. That's their God-given liberty. And those who want to follow the example of the disciples and meet on Sunday, should meet on Sunday, because they too have their own God-given liberty. And instead of Christian brethren striving about the law, we should put our time and energy into reaching the unsaved, as did the disciples. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and useless. But I have found by experience over the last 40 years that most Seventh-day Adventists are more concerned about the Sabbath than they are about preaching Christ crucified to the lost. Do you think there's an afterlife? An afterlife? In, it depends. depends on how you define afterlife. Do I believe there's a heaven? Yes. You know, I believe Jesus came down to die for us. Do you agree with Marcus? Yes, I agree with Marcus. Are you a Christian? No. A heaven and a hell? Yes. So where are you going? Do you think you're in terrible danger? No. Okay. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. How many lies have you told in your life? Millions. What do you call someone who's told lots of lies? Liar. So what are you? Liar. Have you ever stolen something? Yes. What do you call someone who steals things? Slick. Well, they're a thief. Oh, nice. So what are you? Slick. No, you're a lying thief by your own admission. True. Do you still think you're a good person? Yes. So you think a lying thief is a good person? That's a very low standard of morality. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Tell me why not. Because I love my mom. <clears throat> I love my mom. And you respect her? Yes. But you don't respect and love God. So serious, it's called blasphemy, punishable by death in the Old Testament. Do you still think you're a good person? Yes. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. When did you last look at pornography? A mm, couple months ago. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes. Okay. Here's a summation of this little court case. I'm not judging you. This is for you, not for me. You've told me you're a lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, adulterate heart who is self-righteous, which is a sin in itself, and saying you're a good person when it's clear you're not. You're like the rest of us. So here's where we're going with this. This is the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four, on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Innocent. Why would you be innocent when you're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, adulterate heart? Well, at the time, I didn't know it was that bad. So when you had sex, you didn't know it was wrong to have sex before marriage? Nope. You didn't know it was wrong to blaspheme and lie and steal? Well, stealing, like, from a store, stealing in general. Which did you do? Both? One. You know, you, you plead innocent, but there's uh, something called mens rea in law. Have you heard of mens rea? No. Have you heard of mens rea? I have not. Yeah, it's a, a, it's a point of law where the person has to have a knowledge of guilt where you can't prosecute them. If a man rapes a woman and didn't know it was wrong, you can't prosecute him under law. But if he knew it was wrong, and we all know that's wrong, then you can prosecute him to the full. And you are guilty before God because he gave you a conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. So when you stole, lied, blasphemed, fornicated, or looked at pornography, you did it with knowledge that it was wrong. Therefore, 
Your guilt will be sure on Judgment Day. God has justified and given you the death sentence. Is this making sense? Yes. So, can you see that you're in big trouble if you died today? No. Well, you are, and I care about you. Man, I don't want you to end up in hell. The Bible says all liars live their part in the lake of fire. Do you know what death is according to the Bible? Nope. There's a famous Bible verse, the wages of sin is death. Have you heard of that, Mark? I have not. Yeah, it's Romans 6.23, a very famous Bible verse. Death is wages given to you by God for your sins. In the same way, a criminal will be given the death sentence by a judge after he's committed some heinous crime like murdering a couple of young girls. The judge will say, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. And sin is so serious in God's eyes, he's given you the death sentence. That's how serious God is it's about sin. He's given you capital punishment. And after death, the judgment. So you'll stand before God and give an account of not only every deed you've done, but every thought you've thought and every word you've spoken. That's what the Bible says. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Scripture says, all liars live their part in the lake of fire. And the thought of you dying and ending up in hell horrifies me. I've just met you, but I love you. I care about you. And I don't want to see you in hell, man. I want to see you in heaven. And if I had tears in my eyes, I wish I could weep for you, but I can't. I'm not that. I'm hard-hearted. I just got tears in my voice. Now, Marcus, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know? Well, of course. He sent his son. Yeah. Jesus died on the cross. Have you heard of that? Yes. Most people have, but they don't know this. The Ten Commandments, which we've looked at, are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. Do you remember his last three words on the cross? I don't, but I actually have a question about the moral law, because I know we keep bringing it up as far as that's how we are judged. So um, there's concerns that the first four laws are according to God, love for God, and the last six are according for man. But uh, Ray, again, just asking, how do you feel about commandment number four? Oh, I think it's uh, relevant, but I do what Jesus did and use the moral law to bring the knowledge of sin. And Jesus in Mark 10 verse 17 didn't mention the fourth commandment. He said to the rich young ruler, you know the commandments, and he named five of them, and the Sabbath wasn't mentioned. You know why? Because a man can't realize he's sinned in violating the Sabbath, which he has, but he knows he's sinned in lying and stealing and blasphemy and adultery and fornication and murder. And uh, Jesus also said to the rich young ruler, defraud not. And I believe the rich young ruler was a, uh, a crook. He was a, an evil man who was defrauding people, and that's why he was rich, and that's why he walked away from Jesus, because he loved his sins. So let's get back to the important question. Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished. That was his last three words. It is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. Guys, if you're in court and someone pays you fine, a judge can legally let you go even though you're guilty. You can say, stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious, but someone's paid him. You're free to go. And you can do that which is legal and right and just. And God can legally dismiss your case even though you're guilty. You can walk out of the courtroom because Jesus paid your fine in full. In other words, God can take death off you and let you live forever legally because of what Jesus did through the cross. And then he rose from the dead, defeated death, and if you'll simply repent of sin, turn from all sin, don't call yourself a Christian, but fornicate and lie and steal, that's playing the hypocrite, just deceiving yourself, so you have to be genuine in your repentance. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. You're like a man on the edge of a plane, 10,000 feet up. He knows he has to jump. He hasn't got a parachute, but this is his plan. He's going to flap his arms and try and save himself. I say to that man, please don't do that. Just trust the parachute. So don't look on your goodness to save you on the day of judgment. It's not going to work. Simply transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. And the minute you do that, you've got God's promise. He'll remit your sins. He'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie because he's without sin, and that means you can trust everything he says, especially the promise of everlasting life. Is this making sense? It is. You're going to think about what we talked about? Yeah. Have I said anything wrong? Well, uh, again, just concerning the Ten Commandments about how important they are because that is how we are judged by. Again, these are God's commandments. He put them on here because they're not only the commandments of earth, but the commandments of his whole universe. Yes. So again, that's why I was inquiring about the fourth commandment, because no matter what, uh, breaking the law is breaking the law, no matter if it's the first commandment or the tenth commandment. 
So again, I just want to know if you know the truth about the fourth commandment, about yes. keeping yes. the Lord's Sabbath. So yeah, I do keep the Sabbath in Christ, and not only that, I keep the same day the disciples kept in the book of Acts. So let me just go back to what I was saying about the commandments. They're like a mirror. They reflect that we've sinned. The Bible says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And we're not saved by keeping the law. We're saved by God's mercy, by His grace and His grace alone. And because we're saved, we obey God. We love Him and we don't violate the Sabbath. If we go to church on a certain day, we do it as to the Lord, as it says in Romans 14. We don't lie, steal, fornicate, blaspheme. We put God first. We don't make a graven image. We don't covet. Not to be saved, but because we're grateful for God's mercy in saving us because God's rich in mercy to all that call upon him. Do you have a Bible at home? Yes. So when I said you're going to think about this, I want you to think seriously about it as though you're going to die tonight at midnight, and then you'd think, man, this is serious business. This is my life. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. 150,000. Aneurysm in your sleep, heart attack. So this is more serious than a heart attack and my motivation for talking to you like this is because I love you, I care about you and like I said, I want to see you in, in heaven, not in hell. So thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And thank you too, Marcus. Of course. And remember, it's the seventh day. That's the Sabbath. Yeah. And I keep what the disciples kept in the book of Acts. Which, is, which day? First day of the week. Okay, God thanks, guys. God wanted, God wanted the seventh day and the holiday. I just got to, I got to tell you something that's embarrassing. We shouldn't be arguing about this in front of your friend. His salvation is so important. We should be preaching Christ. By your salvation too, because if we're going to go ahead and use the scripture as a piece of evidence to follow God's law, we should go ahead and follow it as he intended, which is the seventh day, keeping it holy like he intended in the Garden of Eden. If you enjoy our videos, you'll love the Evidence Study Bible. We can hardly keep it in stock. It's everything you've ever wanted to know about apologetics and reaching the lost, including 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. It will arm you with practical training on evolution, atheism, the teachings of Mormons, Hindus, Muslims, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and much more. including how to effectively, lovingly, and logically share the truth of the gospel. You'll find that it's hundreds of inspiring quotes from the famous, and its practical tips on defending the faith will be a great encouragement. Go to livingwaters.com, click on Store, Books, and then the Evidence Study Bible.